Good morning, girls. Can you believe it's April? This is our oh, this is our last girl talk for the season. It's kind of hard to believe, but hopefully you'll come back next month for our Ladies Day. That's a really special time where we get together for the whole day. And Ruthie will tell you about that in a little bit. But for this morning, we're going to open up in prayer. We're just glad to see you all. Beautiful day outside. How many got to see the eclipse Monday? We, I sort of did, in between the clouds. In one sense, it was like, okay, enough with the eclipse already. But then I got thinking, how many people were so excited about this scientific phenomenon and our God had everything to do with it. So I'm just, I'm praying that through this thing that God was able to speak to hearts. Okay, so we're going to quiet ourselves down so we can open in a word of prayer and get started. Bow with me. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for this day. Thank you for each one of the girls that have gathered here today. And we thank you for the men that are here too, those that are doing their part. Father, thank you for bringing Angela, Angela to us. Thank you for the words that you have given her to speak to us today and that we will open our hearts and be receptive to what you have to say. Thank you for this time that we can take now and praise you, for you are an awesome God. Thank you for creating this wonderful world and for us, creating us, that we can live in it. And we praise you for that. Thank you, Lord, for all that you do for us and for loving us. In Jesus' name, amen. Welcome, Joyce. Good morning. Do you ever open your word of God and as you begin to read, say, Lord, speak to me through these words so that it's not just another story or not just another lesson that we learn in our heads but it becomes in our hearts. And so that's what we want to do this morning because we want to be intimate with the Lord today. So I'm going to ask you if you'll turn around, sing, stand up and sing with us. Um, turn, this is your opportunity to um, move your chairs a little bit so that you can face the front, stand up and, and get situated for the rest of our time together. As we welcome the Lord to just speak to our hearts through his word today, we're seekers of his heart Lord, we want to know you, live our lives to show you all the love we owe you. We're seekers of your heart. Lord, we want to know you, live our lives to show. seekers of your heart. Lord, we want to know you, live our lives to show Oh, 
And the Lord says that everyone who seeks him will find him if we seek him with all of our hearts. Would you have a seat as we continue? Make sure you're turned around so that you can enjoy the rest of the time together. Good morning, ladies. We're glad you joined us for this last girl talk of the season. I hope you've enjoyed our theme of a faith that sails and all the great speakers we had. You can get seasonal tickets for next season. So if you want to reserve your spot now for all of next seasons, you can do that with Lynn after uh, lunch is over. So make sure you get signed up for next season. And then as Jan mentioned, the fun doesn't end just because we're done with Girl Talk. We have Spring Ladies Day, uh, Wednesday, May the 8th with Elisa Childers. Elisa was here two years ago. She's a tremendous defender of the faith and an apologist something that we desperately need in our culture today. Uh, one of the things that Elisa is going to be talking about is uh, called Live Your Truth and Other Lies, How Popular Deceptions Are Making Us Anxious, Self-Obsessed, and Exhausted. You hear it all the time on the news, on commercials, on social media, things like live your truth, you have your truth and I have my truth. Follow your heart, you are enough. You are the boss of you. These are all lies of our culture, and Elisa is going to tell us why they are lies and how we can combat them when we hear them. And then another topic that she's going to deal with is, if Jesus is the word of God, what is the Bible? Uh, there are skeptics that say that Jesus is the word of God and not the Bible, and when Christians view the Bible as authoritative, they are idolizing the Bible. This is false, and we need to know how we can combat that. So what did Jesus, the living word, have to say about the Bible, the written word? And we need to know that. And then we're going to close out Spring Ladies Day with a Q&A time. So you've got time to think of what is the most pressing question you would want to ask someone about what is going on in our culture today and how they can deal with that. So make sure you get your tickets. It's a wonderful all-day event with a continental breakfast, a wonderful gourmet box lunch, and three great teaching sessions. So while some of you were home this morning with your feet up drinking your coffee, the ladies from Barbara's Place were in here setting your tables and making this room look beautiful for you all today. And at lunchtime, yes, thank you, thank you ladies. They do this for Girl Talk, for our hymn sings, they come in and they set all the tables and it's a lot of work, a lot of running around. And then at lunchtime you're going to be served by the men who are in the Colony of Mercy, our addiction recovery ministry for men. But today we get the privilege of hearing one of our current students in Barbara, Barbara's Place share what God is doing in her heart. So please welcome Chrissy. Good morning. Wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whoever is deceived thereby is not wise. My name is Chrissy, and I'm a grateful Christian in recovery from alcohol. I'd like to share with you the turning points that shaped my story. I was born and raised in South Jersey to two loving parents. My, ch my childhood was happy, our home was full of joy, love, and many great times. For a kid, it was simply enchanting. Because I was the baby in the family and my parents' only child, even my extended family doted on me. When I was four years old, my parents started attending and joined a Baptist church that had a school, which is where I spent my entire school career, kindergarten through 12th grade. Upon joining, my mom rededicated her life to the Lord, but my dad remained ambivalent about church. Safe to say I grew up in a carnal Christian household. My dad, a well-traveled career Navy man, drank alcohol daily and with his buddies at family cookouts and parties. He saw no harm in allowing me to try my first sip of beer around age six or seven. Me being daddy's little girl, I wanted to do everything he did. I thought he was the coolest, handsomest man, and this is what I could do to garner his approval. Several times in my life, I'd hear him say that the kids in Italy drank wine, but my mom put a stop to that at one of our pool parties when I turned with the small beer up to my face to see her eyes big and wide and in a stern voice say, put that down. At the age of 14 on a youth retreat with our church, I experienced a spiritual oppression that caused me to doubt my salvation. 
I believed and thought I'd accepted Christ at a young age, or had I? Oftentimes I'd hear preachers say that you could be in the airport and not have your ticket. What if that were me, I began to doubt. I never doubted the validity of God, but rather if I had truly accepted him. Let me explain the oppression. For months, my thoughts were consumed with fear. Fear that I didn't believe in my heart as the Bible said, but rather that I just had head knowledge because that's how I'd been raised and was taught to believe. I sunk into a deep depression because of this. My mother prayed with me and showed me verses of reassurance, but it didn't work. I'd even go to work with my mom because I didn't want to be alone, and what 14-year-old wants to do that? Satan began to really work on me and use this doubt to stump my growth in Christ, and now, like fish to bait, I was on his hook. For years, I'd pray the sinner's prayer, repeatedly begging to truly be saved, never accepting that I was, in fact, already accepted. Years passed of Christian school, Sunday morning church, Sunday evening church, Wednesday night Awana, church, and I was all churched out. I recall at 17 years old telling my mom that I was done being forced to go to church with her and that from now on, I'd go when I wanted. In reality, I was telling God I would do things my way now. Fast forward to 24 years old sitting on my front porch with my best friend, with tears in my eyes expressing how frustrated I was with God because I was still single and a virgin. Most everyone in our friend group had either already gotten married or was having babies out of wedlock, and I was still pure, despite the fact that I had otherwise began living like the world with occasional drinking and attending nightclubs, but hadn't so much as had a boyfriend at this point. I unknowingly had made marriage an idol. My parents had been happily married for 31 years by now, and I longed for my mate. So I once again told God I got it from here and took matters into my own hands. I began my quest for love, dating sporadically, getting involved in relationships that I should never have been in, engaging in sexual immorality, and having my heart broken repeatedly when, I to when told I'd be the perfect woman if I'd just lose 70 pounds, or that I was too pretty to be so fat. The years passed on and I was now drinking a little more, relationships failing, including a broken engagement, gaining more weight, and still not giving much thought to the Lord. In, 29, in 2019, at 35 years old, I went down in the basement with my dad. He turned and asked, you not drinking tonight? I said, no, dad, I drank too much last night. His response, everything in moderation. Well, two days later, my mom woke me up and called me downstairs to the most shocking news of my life. My dad, who I loved, and who'd been the only man to have had my heart, had suddenly passed away in their bedroom from heart disease. From here on out, I ignored my father's advice, and I lived my life with anything but moderation, as he had warned. Eight months later, I entered into an emotionally abusive, toxic relationship to a much older man. My drinking picked up more and more. My weight increased, and I needed help. I was told about gastric sleeve and decided to research it. During the pre-op phase, one doctor told me to stop taking a leave, which I took multiple times a day, first to help ease the pain of the stress, the weight was putting on my aching body, and second, to sleep. So I stopped the Aleve and was introduced to edibles, marijuana-infused candy or brownies. My weight soared all the way up to 314 pounds. The psychiatrist during this phase also warned me that this surgery causes the highest number of alcoholics because we exchange one addiction for another. Unfazed and in slight disbelief, I went through with the surgery in 2021. I began to lose weight, and around the 50-pound weight loss mark, I decided the doctor clearly didn't know what she was talking about or it didn't pertain to me. Over the past five years since my dad passed, I've used alcohol as entertainment, distraction, and an escape. Believing I was fat, lazy, and unlovable, having just broken up with my older boyfriend, quickly nearing 40 years old, not having a penny to my name and still living at home with mom, I felt like a loser. This past summer, my life really spiraled, and during this time, I experienced my greatest brokenness, drinking morning, noon, and night. My drinking had gone from use to abuse to dependence. One night, high on an edible and unintentionally watching a movie about the end times, I went to the bathroom and cried to the Lord, I can't keep living like this. Change me. I know I'm wrong. And God met me there deep in my mess. Over the next few weeks, I'd try several times to quit drinking on my own. But after about the third time, I realized this had a stronger grip on me than I had originally thought. 
So I reached out to my best friend who in the past ran Celebrate Recovery at her church. I asked if she knew any outpatient programs, but she said, if your drinking is as bad as you say, then you need to look into this place. She sent me the link to Barbara's place. I clicked, and what caught my attention almost immediately is that here I would develop heart application and not just head knowledge, which I've had for years. Since being at Barbara's place, I've experienced my greatest spiritual triumphs. I will no longer allow others to dictate my value based on my size or status in life, because I have found that my worth is in Christ and in him alone. My impatience in the past led me to sin that led me so far away from the Lord. But like that fish that took the bait and has to physically be removed off the hook, unable to take itself off, Jesus, the same fisherman and savior he was yesterday, has today removed me off the hook of sin and depravity I was on. Where I once felt burdened by having a godly mother making me go to church, I now see the blessing and am grateful to have had the foundation of the private school her and my father put me in. Where I once took my life into my own hands, thinking I could do a better job than the Lord, I now surrender it all. Since being at Barbara's place, the Lord has also revealed the love of my life that I've been searching for for so many years. I'm falling in love with him daily, and his name is Jesus. I've been at Barbara's place for nearly four months, with two left to go, but I ask you, my sisters, to please keep me in your prayers. The road I have ahead of me on my journey with Christ is long, and with his help, I will continue to fight the good fight. I will finish my race, because I know that he who has begun a good work in me will continue to do it till the day of Jesus Christ. Wow, praise the Lord. Thank you, Christy. It does take a lot to stand up here and share how God is working in someone's life. So I commend you, Chrissy. Thank you for sharing. And praise God for the work he's doing. Amen? You know, this very day is a day that we are able to serve the men in the program and the women in Barber's Place. We're able to point to Jesus Christ for salvation, but also restoration in life. How the only one who, that we need is Jesus Christ. As a faith ministry, we don't receive state or federal funding. We're supported through the prayers of God's people and through the provision through his people. And this very day, we're able to serve them because of partners like you. And so I would ask that if you would consider praying for America's Keswick daily, would you pray for us? And today we're going to take an offering on the tables. You'll see a clear envelope inside there, are the yellow envelopes. Would you consider a love gift today so that we can continue to serve the women in Barbara's place, the men in the colony, and serve the Lord the way that God has called us to. Thank you so much. And it's my privilege to introduce my co-worker, Mr. David Harris. Would you make him welcome? Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I was, I was just thinking about what to share in reference to the name of this song is he will carry you. And I was thinking about that in Isaiah 46 and 6 talks about when we feel like we have no strength in us, God becomes our strength and carries us through. Let this Bible verse remind you that you don't have to go through it alone. He is with us. He will fight for us. He will carry us through. There is no problem to be God cannot solve it. There is no mountain too tall. God cannot move it. And there is no storm too dark. God cannot calm it. 
There is no sorrow too deep He cannot soothe If He carries the weight of the world Upon His shoulders I know, my sisters, that He will carry you if he carries the weight of the world upon his shoulders i know my sister that he will carry you he said come God cannot solve it. There is no mountain too tall. God cannot move it. And there is no storm too dark. God cannot calm it. There is no Sorrow too deep, he cannot soothe it. If he carries the weight of the world upon his shoulders, I know, my sister, that he will carry you. carries the weight of the world upon his shoulders. I know, my sister, that he will carry you. If he carries the weight of the world upon his shoulders, that he will carry you I know that he will carry you Thank you, David, for that reminder, a beautiful reminder of God's faithfulness. Faithful through the ages. That's what we've been studying this year. And David over here at this table has CDs that he's just put out, and that song is on the CD. You want to make sure you encourage him, and you take that home so it will encourage you as you go. God will use that in your life. On your tables, you also have information about our Family Freedom Walk that is coming up. And you can help us um, by putting a dollar in that, give a dollar um, envelope to get us started. And by coming or supporting one of our staff who are walking or someone from your church, you can, get, you can get a group together of your friends and you can come and participate in that day and give back as a group. What a great way to give and serve and give back to what this ministry has meant to you over this season. I am so thankful to have with us um, our speaker today, Angela Sackett. She has been here with us before, but let me tell you a little bit about her. Um, Angela is a wife and a mama. She's a book junkie, a foodie, a photographer, and a light geek. I say that because you have to ask her what a light geek is. She said I could just say she's a geek, but she's a lover of words, written, spoken, and sung, and she's passionate about inspiring women through words and through images to create and tell the story of truth. 
She's a full-time ministry wife and home educator, and she's passionate about encouraging women to get their face in the Word and then to get their hands and hearts busy walking out life as God leads us for His glory and for our good. She writes and speaks about food as a vehicle for truth. She teaches and mentors women in parenting and becoming more attentive students of the Bible. And she challenges everyone she can to go deeper in the Word. She has a great blog that I hope she will tell you a little bit more about. It's called EverydayWelcome.com. Hospitality is her key. So I think it's amazing that she chose to speak to us today about breakfast on the beach. And a great way for us to end, she is going to come, and I ask you to please welcome her with me. Angela, please come and share your heart today. So a light geek, she asked me that right before she came up. Thanks, Joyce. A light geek to me as about... I don't know, 15 years ago, I started a little photography business in Florida as a side thing while my husband was pastoring college students. And it grew to eventually for a while become our family's full-time business. And I love watching the way God lights up the world. Um, I tell the story about driving down the road one day and my oldest was probably 10 or 11. And he said, Mama, look at the way the sun is coming through those clouds and kissing the trees. And I'm like, yes. (laughs) Um, There's something magical about the way that God uses light in our lives. So that's what light geek means. I'm going to pray, and then we'll dive in. Lord, thank you so much for this morning. I thank you for the women who have carved time in their schedules and um, invested in they're with their financing to come here and enjoy a beautiful lunch. I thank you for this ministry that serves so many people as a retreat to get away from everyday life and come face to face with you and for the ministries that help men and women come out of addiction. Every one of us, Lord, as one writer said, are little idol makers and we will take anything to try to fill our need to be seen, to be loved, to feel full but you are the only one who fills us with what our hearts need and desire. So I pray, Lord, this morning that you would fill us with your word, that you would help us to see you for who you are and see ourselves in that light. We're created in your image, God. We're called to follow you, to love you, to serve you with our whole lives. And so for each woman who's sitting here right now, wherever she is in her journey with you, whether she hasn't met you yet, whether she said, yes, I'll follow you yet, or whether she's given her life to serve you, I pray that you would have something for her today to feast on from your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So my husband and I, just a little bit of background. For six years, we were able to serve here in New Jersey at Harvey Cedars Bible Conference on Long Beach Island. And so about three years ago, actually this week, I think, we received a call to move to a little tiny town in Virginia called Wise. And actually, there's a sweet sister here this morning who grew up in that same town. That was a cool, cool find to get to meet her. But we are now serving at a camp called Camp Bethel. It was founded in 1939. There's literally no place I can walk into in town and mention the name of the camp that somebody doesn't say, oh my goodness, I memorized 100 Bible verses so I could go there for free one summer. That's where I came to meet Jesus. Yeah, memorized 100 Bible verses. It's convicting. So it's been really precious to come there. However, it's also a town where... Uh, Everybody knows everybody, everybody's related to everybody, and often, historically, outsiders are looked at with suspicion and caution, and yet God has been very kind to my husband and I. Uh, The camp several years ago went through a hard fall, a moral downfall that really honestly divided an entire town, and we met many people within the first few weeks there who said, I'm never going back there, because they saw the weakness of man and the damage that it can cause. And yet in the three years that we've been there, we've watched God raise up people in the community who are praying, who are giving of their time. We have people that work full-time jobs and still show up six days a week and come and help us with broken toilets and bats and spiders and chinking and logs. Ask me about that. 
and God is doing really good things. So that's where I come to you from today. I'm very grateful to be here. And we're going to dig into a couple of passages this morning. For me, it is now a really great privilege to be on the shore. And when Joyce asked what I want to talk about, I didn't have to blink an eye because this is one of my favorite passages in Scripture. So if you have your Bibles or your Bibles on your phones, flip them open to John 21. We're going to read a chunk together this morning. If we were sitting around the tables in smaller groups, I'd say, hey, take turns reading out loud. But since you all don't have mics, I'll read for us today. But stick with me. We're going to read verses 1 to 21. So this is after Jesus has died, he's been resurrected, and he's going to make an appearance to a group of people who are very special to him. Right before this, we see John writing in the book um, his purpose of this book, and I'm going to touch on that a little bit later, but if, if you're somebody like me who's a word nerd, you can sneak and go back and look at the verse right before chapter 21 starts and see where we're going to go at the end of today. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, or another version says, hey guys, hey kids, brothers, do you have any fish? They answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved, therefore, said to Peter, it is the Lord When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he had stripped for work, and he threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from land, but about a hundred yards off. When they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place, with fish laid on it and bread. I love, by the way, that we have a fire this morning, almost like they knew. (laughs) So they saw the fire in place, and Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Hold on to that. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared ask him, Who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and so with the fish. This is now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they'd finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. And then Jesus said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. So Jesus has died and he's been resurrected. And for those of you who have studied the Bible for very long, there's a scene that's happening here that you may have seen elsewhere before. And we're going to read that in just a little while. But it's familiar. It's happened before. It's not the first time there have been some guys in a boat and a strange man comes up to them and says, hey, do it a different way. There's a charcoal fire, interestingly, there's a charcoal fire mentioned twice in scripture regarding Jesus, and we're going to talk about the other one soon. And there's a boat with nets and failures to catch and some strange instructions. A couple of things that I want us to note about this story this morning. First of all, it's an intimate scene. These guys are alone. It's early in the morning. 
They've lost their teacher, their Lord, the one they loved and gave their lives to and followed. And then he was raised again, and everything's kind of up in the air, and they're not really sure what's all going on. And then he calls them children. Or another translation for the word here used in Greek is boys. It's a term of affection, of endearment. And still, they don't quite get it when he calls out to them in the boat. Another thing I want you guys to note is that Jesus is already there ahead of them. He's waiting with a meal prepared to meet them. He's not surprised that they're there. He has everything that they need for this meal. He's already cooked fish and he's already got bread. They don't have to provide anything themselves, but he invites them to join in the provision. He says to them, hey, bring those fish that you caught. Let's cook those up too and let's have breakfast together. He tells them to try it his way. These are professional fishermen. They've done this with their lives. They know what they're doing and yet all night they've caught nothing. And he says, try it a new way. Again, this might sound familiar to you. There's another story in scripture that sounds a little bit like this. There's no missing the fact that he is at work. He's the God of the universe. He's the one who made those 153 fish that scripture so interestingly tells us. And he's the one who made the fishermen that he says, try it my way. Some authors say that the reason that 153 is mentioned, not that the number itself is significant, but we need to see that it's tangible, that God is the master, and that every detail matters to him, and it's miraculous. And we see this too. John knows at this point, as soon as this little miracle happens, he knows who it is. It's the master. He calls him that. And he knows because God is providing for him. Jesus is providing for him. That's how they recognize him. John 10, 27 says, My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. This word know and this word follow are pretty significant and we're going to get to those too. The word that Peter calls Jesus when he goes jumping out of that boat is curios. It means Lord and master. He's saying, you're the boss of me. If that's what you want me to do, I'm all in. And he jumps into the water. A couple of other things here. When scripture tells us here that Jesus has prepared bread for them, the word is artos. And this word bread is the same word that Jesus used in John 6, when he tells the listeners that he is the bread of life, that God has used Jesus to provide everything that we as human beings need to be filled spiritually and also physically. In Mark 14, at the Last Supper, we see while they were eating, Jesus took some bread and after a blessing, he broke it and gave it to them and said, take it, this is my body. Not only does God provide the things that we think we need, provisions, but he provides himself and he is our provision. And I want to start with that this morning. Chrissy, wherever you are, if you're still in here, thank you for sharing your testimony, girl. I wrote your name on my hands. (laughs) Because what I appreciate it is that you address that need that every one of us has. We want to be loved. We want to be filled. And we will go after anything to get it, right? And I'll get in your business a little bit. A friend told me a few years ago, don't say you're sorry when you get in their business because we all need it. So I'm in my business too when I say, be thinking right now as you're sitting here, what are those things that you go to to fill the hole in your heart when you're spiritually hungry and you think, oh, I'll eat this or I'll drink this or I'll watch this or I'll listen to that and maybe I'll feel a little bit less lonely. I'll feel a little bit less hungry. I'll feel a little bit less sad. Whatever those things are, let them go. Because Jesus is not only our provider, he is our provision for everything we need. So Peter throws on his clothes and he goes running to Jesus in the water. I always thought that was kind of funny. It says he was stripped down for work. He's putting on his clothes to jump in the lake and go after Jesus. The Greek, the Greek word here, I love this so much. When it says he jumps into the water, it's ballo, and it means like a missile. I don't think they had missiles back then, but he's out of there. He is going for Jesus. I have some really sweet friends here that I haven't seen in at least a year, and I was telling some of them when I went running to hug them, I'm praying I don't break any bones because 
oh, I just wanted to get my arms around them and love them. Do we love Jesus like that? Do we go running after him like a missile, forsaking all those other little things that we might try to fill ourselves with? He was stripped for work. He was bare, clean in order to do what he needed to do. There's another place where this kind of concept is, um, is used that, that hit me a couple of weeks ago. I'm studying the book of Colossians with some local ladies in Wise where I live. And we got to chapter 3, and it's um, the first two chapters of Colossians. Paul spends building a foundation for what our faith is, what it means to be saved, what it means to be a child of God and Jesus. And then starting in chapter 3, he starts to apply those to how does that look in our everyday lives. Girls, I had to teach last week to a group of women about submitting to your husband. It was hard. <laughs> but it's all about what are the things that we do in our lives where we say, I will lay down my will, I will lay down my rights and what I think I deserve in order to follow, there's that word again, what Jesus says to do. And it says in Colossians 3, casting off, it lists all of these sins and it says, cast them off and then put on these deeds, these acts of righteousness. And when I went digging into these words, I told you I'm a word nerd, I found this really cool thing about the word cast off. It literally means like rip it off and throw it away. Now, we haven't eaten lunch yet, so I'm going to tell you a story that's kind of gross. <laughs> but it gave me a vision of what I thought this might look like. When we first moved to Wise, Virginia, the camp that we're at has... I've been told the largest collection in this part of America of restored log cabins that have literally been brought from other places piece by piece, like Lincoln Logs. They have numbers carved in them, put back together. And we have a tent camping site, which we have not had a chance to get our hands on yet. And we have an RV site. And we have these volunteers who come in the summer. And actually, I think Keswick has a sowers, sowers ministry. These are these cool people who RV, and they will go and stay at camps and Christian colleges, and they'll serve and, and stay there for like a month at a time. So we had this couple, older couple, who's been coming for years, and an inspector came from the town. Now, we're learning all kinds of things we did not have to learn when we served at Harvey Cedars with a full staff of people. Did I mention my husband's the only staff person at this camp? So he gets a call from the um, inspector who's there from the town. He says, I've got to, I've got to inspect the RV hooks, hookups. And my husband's like, well, I, I can't come right now, but go ahead and do what you need to do and then let me know how it happens. So meanwhile, this sweet lady who's in her RV she meets with the, our, the inspector, and he says, well, there's something not right about this hookup. i got to fix it. Now, we have since learned that the inspector's not supposed to touch anything. They're just supposed to look. But he adjusts something, and about an hour later, my husband gets this panicked call, and this woman is literally screaming into his ear, I'm very sorry for what I'm about to tell you. There's poop in my RV. <laughs> So whatever he adjusted, and I don't know RVs, but it was causing backflow, I think that's what it is, to wash up into her RV. Her husband had gone into town, and she couldn't get a hold of him, so she called my husband to go out to the RV, and for four hours he spent mopping, draining, cleaning, swabbing, while she cried. Her husband, we couldn't get a hold of her husband. <laughs> and... He came back home, and can I just tell you that I could smell him coming? <laughs> Ministry life ain't all that glamorous, always, sometimes, not really. <laughs> and I got, he got to the front door, and I said, stop, strip, <laughs> you are not coming in this house. Also, we live in a three-room cabin, so it's kind of all one big, you are not coming in this house, strip. You know, I told this story to the college students in a Bible study that we lead a couple weeks ago, and they all were like, I did not need that image of <laughs> Brian in my head. But that's the image I think of when it talks about stripping off the old, stripping off what is not becoming, what is stinky, what is gross, what is nasty. Praise God, my husband does those dirty things because I'm not called to that. But then scripture says in Colossians 3 to put on these things, these acts of love, of righteousness, being humble, being forgiving, being patient, being steadfast. And the description of the word there that's used to put on has this imagery of donning royal robes. 
The other image is donning a robe, something that's really comfortable. And so what I take away from that is God is calling us who are in Christ, those who are sons and daughters of God through Jesus, through our faith in him, our trust in him, to throw off, to rip off, to take off what is nasty, what is not becoming to who we are as women of God, and to settle in to the robes of who we are called to be. And that is played out in our everyday lives in the things that we do, in the acts of reflecting Jesus. Now, that's not how we earn God's love. That's not how we make ourselves worthy of being called daughters of the king. It's our response in love to him. And let's see how that plays out with Peter here, with Jesus. So there's an interesting section here. God has fed the disciples. He has led the disciples. He has taught the disciples in the form of Jesus, the third person of the Godhead. They followed him. They heard him speak time and time again. They watched him perform miracles. They ate with him. They slept with him. There was a sweet intimacy in that relationship. And you'd think they should have known him well enough after all that time together that it was a no-brainer to follow him with their whole lives. But like us, they didn't quite get it. And they struggled still to find their own way. So in this passage, you'll notice three times Jesus says to Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And to read it, it almost sounds like Peter gets kind of exasperated. Yes, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. There's a number three here. Anybody else think of another three connected to Peter? Denial. Three times Jesus told Peter, by the way, beforehand, you're going to deny me three times. Peter said, no way, I would never deny you. I love you more than anything. But he did three times. And three times, Jesus asks Peter here after the fact, do you love me? It's almost as if Jesus is giving him three times to make right what was broken. Not that Peter can make it right, but that the God who knew the mistake, the sin that he would make in the first place, the betrayal, is giving him that opportunity to be reconciled to him. So there's a sermon from Spurgeon that had three points that I really loved. Spurgeon says this, there's a question, there's an answer, and there's a proof. And I'll quickly go over those. Jesus asks these questions, the same question, three times of Peter. The bottom line is Jesus already knows the answer. And Peter even says that. He says, Lord, you know. You know everything about the universe. You know I love you. But he wants Peter to think it over. And I think sometimes as women, we get so busy going through life, doing all the things, taking care of our kids and our grandkids, and doing the things we do at church and showing up at awesome lunches that we don't stop and really mull over, where is my heart? What is the condition of my heart? Do I love him? Jesus gives him the opportunity to mull it over. One author says this, Spurgeon, it is well, especially after a foul sin, that the Christian should well probe the wound. It is right that he should examine himself, for sin gives grave cause for suspicion. And it would be wrong for a Christian to live an hour with a suspicion concerning his spiritual estate unless he occupy that hour in examination of himself. We should be asking ourselves those questions. What is the state of my heart? What am I craving and going after? Or am I fully, completely, yes, Jesus, I love you? The answer, Peter is humbled. He's gone from being the big guy who jumped in and went all in and said, no, Lord, I would never betray you, to saying, yes, I love you, you know. He gives Jesus that position of authority. And then the proof, Peter's called to walk out his love for Jesus in relationship. Again, I mentioned Colossians, other letters that Paul wrote to the early church. We can go running to those and see how is it that God's called me to walk out this relationship with God. And again, not that we earn his love. Just like Peter, God already knew before we were created in our mother's womb how many times you and I would betray him. And he still says, come. 
So we're going to now go to Luke 5. If you've got those Bibles, flip with me there. Luke chapter 5. And we're going to start at verse 1 and go to 11. And this is where it might sound familiar. On one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret. He saw two boats by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put out a little from the land, and he sat down and taught the people from the boat. And when he'd finished speaking, he said to Simon, put into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing. This is Peter, by the way, the guy that we just read about. Master, we toiled all night and took nothing, but at your word, I will let down the nets. And when he had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both the boats, so they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and did what? Followed him. So this is before. This is their first calling. How cool is the Bible that we have these stories that weave together? I was telling someone the other day, I feel like, did anybody else read those um, Choose Your Own Adventure books when you were a kid? Those were my, nobody? Okay, good. <laughs> Go find them if they still exist. They're the coolest thing ever. You got to pick the ending. And I said, the Bible is like that, except God chooses the adventure and we get to go along for the ride. It's so cool. So all night again, the same idea. They were fishing all night, trying to do it their own way. And Jesus, the God of the universe, comes and says, hey, try it my way. Now, there's something interesting that's different in this story that I noticed when I was studying. The boats we read here are sinking. The nets are breaking. Flash forward to after they've spent time walking with Jesus, watching him do what he does, changing their lives. And their, boat, their nets and their boats didn't sink and break in that first story that we read, I just wonder, is it possible that God has expanded their understanding and their hearts enough that they can kind of start to hold on to his greatness and his goodness? We are never going to fully grasp that before we're face to face with him. But man, my prayer is that I will increasingly get what Jesus has done in my life. John 13, 30 to 38, we read the story of Peter's denial. Again, there's a charcoal fire in that story. I found it's only mentioned two places in Scripture that there's a fire with Jesus. And if you ever want some cool reading, go read about what some authors have said about the significance of that. One of the thoughts is it's symbolic of him burning away those things, kind of like the story of my husband in the nasty, stinky clothes that are not befitting who we are. Here's the cool takeaway. Jesus knows what's going to happen, and he offers redemption anyway. He looked Peter in the eyes, and he said, you will betray me. And after you've done this, and after you have been reconciled to me, you will follow me, and you will lead and bless others. Sisters, for every woman in this room, I don't care if you're 30 or 75 or 85, the Lord knew before he made you how many times you would mess up as a mom, as a wife, as a friend, as a coworker. And as Spurgeon says, it's good for us to think about that stuff, but here's why, not to wallow in it to glory in God's grace toward us. That not only does he come to us and say, I forgive you, but come after me and let's do things to point to my glory and to bring others to me. Psalm 129, one to seven says, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit and rise. You understand my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down. You are aware of all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, you know all about it, Lord. You hem me in behind and before. You've laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. 
So here are some takeaways from these passages that I think we can walk away with today. First of all, following Jesus is a responsive act. You didn't do anything to earn it. And if you're honest, if I'm honest, I did a whole lot of things to disqualify me from being loved by God. And yet, Scripture says, he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality and thieves. There's a whole list. But you were washed, sanctified, justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. He does the pursuing. The second thing I think we can take away is that following Jesus It's a gift with his provision. Go back to that scene on the shore. I can picture the salt, what it smells like, what the sky looks like early in the morning. Do you ever go walking on the beach early in the morning? I see some heads nodding. I'm I'm going to get there, even though it's going to rain tomorrow, I think. I'm still going to get out there and get my feet in that sand. I love the feeling of the grit. It's a real intimate setting that, that scripture gives us to picture God asked them to do it differently from their way. He made a way for them. He provided that meal before they got there. And more than anything they could have contained on their own, they could not have caught those fish on their own. He had to provide for him. Third, following Jesus means loving him. Not just going to church, not just showing up at events where other women are, but it means loving him with everything that we are. And loving him means obeying him. Very interesting little nugget. There are a lot of different interpretations about those three questions that Jesus asked Peter. But there's something interesting. The first time that Jesus says to Peter, do you love me? The word he uses there is agape, which means a love that chooses, that pursues. It's that never-ending perfect love that God has for us. And Peter's response to him is, yes, Lord, I phileo you. I love you in a brotherly way, buddy to buddy, human to human. The second time Jesus asks the question and the third time, he says, Peter, do you phileo me? So he changes from asking Peter, do you love me the way that I love you to do you love me the way that a brother loves, the way that a follower loves? And each time Peter answers, yes, I love you that way. Now, again, there are a lot of scholars a lot smarter than me who have gone into long diatribes about what that means. But I'll tell you what I hear there is Jesus knows that my capability of loving is about this big. And he still says, I love you this big. But he calls us to love him back, however imperfectly we can do it to follow him and to love him back. Loving him is visible by producing good fruit in you and through you. Spurgeon said this, Peter didn't, or Jesus did not say, Simon, believest thou in me? But he asked him another question, lovest thou me? I take it that's because love is the very best evidence of piety. Love is the brightest of all the graces and hence it becomes the best evidence. So when it comes to how I treat my husband, This is recorded, isn't it? I love you, honey. (laughs) When it comes to how I treat my kids when I've had a long day and I'm irritated and they've made a mess in the house and I came home and I have to deal with it. Actually, they're very gracious and kind of helping. When it comes to how I respond to my girlfriend who just hurt me very badly by giving away a secret I asked her not to share. When it comes to how I love that neighbor who was not nice to me the other day. The way that I respond is the way that they see God's love and his goodness and his steadfastness and his forgiveness despite what we deserve. Following Jesus does mean loving others. One author, John Piper, notes that Jesus moves here from calling them fishermen at that first calling to telling Peter, you will be a shepherd who will feed, who will lead, who will care for my sheep. So I'm, I, Joyce and I were talking about this. I'm a, I'm a foodie. I love good food. I made some toast sugar that you can put in your coffee that I brought to share and some seasoned salt. I love to feed people. And actually at the camp that we're at now, sometimes I cook because we don't have a chef. 
We need a chef in case anyone wants to move to Virginia. <laughs> but I have kind of adopted this as a way that we can love and care for the people in our lives. And what I want to ask each of you is, maybe you like to cook. Maybe you're good at takeout. Maybe you like to go for walks and take the dog out for a walk. Maybe you're a go-get-coffee girl. Maybe you're a go-shopping kind of girl. Maybe you are just a good listener. And by just, I mean, man, you are precious. What are the ways that God has given you that you can love others for his glory? So how do we respond to these takeaways? Well, there are two ways. Number one, I think there are two different types of ladies who are sitting here with me this morning. Maybe you're in this room, and this was a nice story, and this is going to be a nice lunch and nice fellowship, and there are some nice vendors you should go visit. But it's kind of out there for you. Maybe you haven't yet met Jesus. Maybe you're like the disciples. When they first saw him, they saw his miracles, and they even followed him but they didn't yet know him. And I want to say to you this, if you are in this room this morning, then you are being given an invitation to know him. Back to John 13, 36 to 38. Here's the, uh, kind of gave you a little bit of a spoiler at the beginning. John says in the verses right before this story about Peter and this offer of forgiveness, these things, he talks about the miracles that Jesus did while he was on earth, these things are written that you might believe, and that in believing, have life. If you are sitting here in this room this morning, and you don't yet know Jesus, can I tell you something? You don't have life. You might have a semblance of it, you might have some cool, exciting, fun things happening for you, but you don't yet know who you were made to be. And Jesus is inviting you to come meet with him. So whether it's finding one of the ladies at your table or come find me or go and meet with your pastor, whoever that is, I want to encourage you, ask the questions. But right now, in this moment, you can say, whatever that looks like, Jesus, I know that I don't have it in me. I'm not a follower. I've made huge mistakes. I have betrayed you. I am broken. I am sinful. I'm dead in my sin, scripture describes us. You can say, I believe in you. Whatever that looks like, I want to follow you. And Ephesians 2, 13 to 16 says, But now in Christ, who you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, Confess with your mouth and believe in your heart and you will be saved. So that's number one. If you don't know him, today is the day you can come to know him. And number two, maybe you do know Jesus, but you've loved him imperfectly. Maybe you failed him catastrophically. Maybe you failed in a marriage or you have kids that you can look back and say, gosh, I did not mother them the way that I should have. Maybe you can list off the ways that you have made huge, gumptious mistakes in your life. Guess what? He already knew before you did it. And he still said, come, follow me, love me back because he loved us first. So I want to encourage you and I want to challenge you and I want to dare you to come feast on the bread of life in the word which the Bible tells us is living, it's alive. Come spend time with him. And scripture we see over and over again, the encouragement is in the morning. That's why I picked breakfast. Breakfast is my favorite meal of the day. I'll eat it any time of day. Ask anyone that knows me. We're invited every morning in the fresh light of the day to come and be with him. I want to encourage you to follow him. Go where he goes. For me and my family in this season, it was to follow him to the mountains of southwest Virginia. I don't like bats and carpenter bees, and I really hate frogs. And if you come find me, I'll tell you an awful story about tadpoles when we first got there. But man the opportunity to meet people that I never knew in my life before and to share in God's goodness and his grace, the opportunity to sit down with college students who come to UVA's little campus in a tiny little town in Southwest Virginia for four years, sometimes even a year for some of them, and to say, hey, come to the little coffee shop we have, sit with me, let me tell you about who you were meant to be. I wouldn't trade that for anything. For each one of you, that looks different. Maybe somebody's here is called to go to Southwest Virginia. We'll talk. 
but maybe you're called to be right here in South Jersey. What is around you? Who is around you that Jesus is saying, follow me. Love those who I've called to be mine. Love me. And he already knows you're going to do it imperfectly, but come do it anyway. He asks us to lay down our lives for him, to give up our rights, to give up our dreams for what we think magic will look like. But can I tell you, sometimes he gives you answers to dreams you didn't know you even had. Ask me about some of those too, and I'll tell you some of the ways that we've gotten to see him work. But here's what I want to say to you. If you're in Christ, if you're a daughter of the king, if you are a follower of Jesus, don't just follow him. Get away alone with him when nobody else is around and meet him in his word. That is the most intimate scene to me to picture, getting to sit with Jesus. And as much as I love a good meal, can you imagine what fried fish over a fire by the king of kings tasted like? Can you imagine what it tastes like to tear off a piece of bread that was made for you by the bread of life? Don't forsake that. I can't believe when I get to the end of the day and I realize I didn't spend time with him in his word. Go meet with him in his word. And then finally, meet with his people. If you're not in a church, you need to get in a church. If you're not in a Bible study, get in one because you need to sit with sisters. And this is for you too. If you're in this room and you just this morning are saying, yes, I want to follow Jesus, go find some other women who will get in his word with you and study to know him more with everything that you have. Prayerfully seek to reflect him in your earthly relationships and ask him who doesn't know you that I need to shine your glory. One very quick story and I'm done. A few years ago, I was doing a, it's called a Whole30. It's a um, kind of a 30-day elimination diet to kind of figure out what works with your body and what doesn't. I'm not promoting this organization for a lot of reasons, but it was a great journey for me for 30 days. And part of that was I spent some time in the Word asking God, show me where are the areas where I have an unhealthy relationship with food. Because honestly, it was an idol for me. And I opened up my Bible and I read this story about Sean 21. And I flashed back to the year that my dad got married to my stepmom and her family invited my sister and I to a cabin on a lake. And my new stepdad and my stepgrandpa invited me to go fishing for crappie. I think I'm saying it right. We had to get up at four in the morning and go out on the pontoon boat. And I was the only girl and I wasn't raised living with my dad. So this was very foreign to me. And we came back as the sun was just coming up and we'd caught all these crappie fish and my new grandpa, step-grandpa, who I didn't really know, I think I was like 10, he spent the morning teaching me how to clean these fish. And as I was reading this story in John 21, I flashed back to that day when this new grandpa that I barely knew as this very unsettled young girl whose parents were recently divorced, my dad was remarried, and I could smell butter-flavored Crisco in the kitchen as my new step-grandma would take the fish we clean and she would fry it. And I called my dad and I said, Dad, Jesus made breakfast for the disciples and he made them fish over a fire. And it was his way of saying, I love you. And I had that same moment with new grandparents that didn't even know me. That's my invitation to you today. Get away with Jesus. Get away from everything that distracts you. Get your face in his word until the ink stains your cheeks and then go back for more. I stole that from somebody else. Come and meet with Jesus as you feast on his word and then take the ways he has lavishly saved and fed you and share it with the world. Love God, love people, and celebrate the home that you're in in the reflection of the home that we are going to someday. And man, I hope we get to be neighbors. Well, that was a great way to end our season, wasn't it? We, ha we serve a faithful God, every one of us, and I'm thankful that we were reminded of that today. Uh, would you bow your heads and we ask the Lord's blessing on our food together. Heavenly Father, thank you for your presence here with us. Thank you for speaking to us through your word. And I pray, Lord, that the conversation around the table would be edifying and encouraging as we rehash what we've heard and we think about the truth that you've 
um, put into our heads, Lord. May it settle down into our hearts as we visit together. Lord, may you be honored and glorified. And thank you for your blessing on this place. Continue to bless Keswick for um, its ministry in our lives and the guest groups that are here staying and the men in the Colony of Mercy and the women in Barbara's Place. God, you are so good, and we are so thankful. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Enjoy your meal.